My name is Anna Jungna Nordgren, and I have the great pleasure of being the moderator for the following session. Uh, and as Jens already mentioned, a session with the team Labor Market Integration of Refugees, a Welfare Challenge in the Nordic Region. Uh, this session is brought to you by the Nordic Cooperation on Integration and Inclusion Program, which is designed to support the Nordic countries' integration efforts by bolstering Nordic cooperation on the integration of refugees and immigrants through the sharing of experiences and development of new knowledge. During the next hour, we will hear about what is being done in the field of integration on a Nordic cooperation level. Uh, we will hear about how the pandemic has affected the integration processes in the Nordics, uh, and we will learn about the role of the civil society in the integration process. And finally, we will learn about changes and challenges regarding Finland's integration program. I hope you will be active in the chat. Uh, please write your questions and comments there, uh, and hopefully we will have time to get them into the discussion later on. We have splendid speakers here today, uh, but unfortunately not a lot of time. So I think I will give the floor to our first speaker, which is Senior Advisor Kaisa Kepsu from the Nordic Welfare Center. Kaisa will talk about Nordic cooperation on integration. So please go ahead, Kaisa. The floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Thanks a lot. I hope you can hear and see me, as uh, is the normal question to start with. I will just give a few short words about the project uh, we are working with and a little bit about what we do here. The Nordic countries, we believe that we can learn from each other when it comes to working with integration. It is useful to know what others have done and to discuss common challenges, ideas, solutions to one of the biggest challenges we have in the Nordic societies today. And to facilitate this cooperation, the Nordic Council of Ministers started a project, Nordic Cooperation on Integration of Refugees and Immigrants. And we have been working now for about six years and are happy to announce that the project, project will continue at least until 2024. The vision of the Nordic Council of Ministers is uh, that the Nordic region will become the most sustainable and integrated region in the world by the year 2030. Nothing more, nothing less. And uh, integration is closely linked to this. Uh, the one focus is on social sustainability. That means to promote an inclusive region with shared values where refugees and immigrants can become active members of society. Um, but integration in the labor market is, of course, also crucial to ensure the competitiveness of the region. The project uh, is based in Stockholm and Helsinki, uh, but we work uh, on a, with a Nordic scope. We're called a clearing central, but basically that means that we're a node of development and knowledge exchange in the field of integration. That means that we uh, compile and communicate knowledge and collect and share good practices and ideas across the Nordic countries, arrange seminars, discussions, conferences. Uh, importantly, also network building. So we like to bring people together uh, that are working within this field. And we work a lot with experts in this field across all the Nordic countries. All the project results and much more is available on our website, integrationnorden.org. Our main focus in this project is labor market integration, which is the theme of today's uh, session. And in the last year or so, or the, in the last year, the focus area has been on the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, we see that social and economic, economic inequalities have become even more pronounced in the Nordic countries. And the gap in employment level is widening between foreign born in comparison to the native born. And that is particularly true among immigrants born outside the EU. Um, 
we have an upcoming report also about long-term unemployment. This is also linked to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we will see about, look at the recent developments in long-term unemployment among immigrants in the Nordic countries. We have also recently paid special attention to women's job prospects and uh, also early interventions to newly, newly arrived children and families where we have seen a strong connection between these two topics. A new theme for next year will be language learning, a very important uh, tool for integration. And we will come back to that. Uh, but I will uh, promote here also the next report we will have coming up. That's also in the th within the theme of education. It's really interesting. It's about the gender gap uh, in education. As we all know, integration doesn't work equally well on all groups. Um, and in school, we see that foreign born girls in general seem to do really well, um, but boys are lagging behind. It seems that uh, these neighborhoods of, that are socioeconomically vulnerable, they affect boys more than they affect girls. And we see that in the education outcomes. We also see that there are more men among young people who are not in education, employment or training. And this upcoming study will analyze this gender gap in education throughout the Nordic countries. And we will look both at first and second generation immigrants and compare, um, co compare them to the native born. And of course, discuss possible reasons be be behind this gender gap and, and look at good practice from the Nordic countries, if there are any policy recommendations or interventions that have helped. So look out for this report in February next year. So please, if you have a moment, um, go visit our web website on integrationnorden.org. Hopefully, hopefully you can find some inspiration there or follow us on social media. But for now, I will re get really looking forward to this discussion today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kaisa, for your insights and facts. And, and it's great to hear that so much is being done in cooperation uh, in the Nordics. Uh, we may be small nations, but it's true that together we are strong and can move mountains. Uh, and I was th thrilled to hear about your new project uh, regarding language learning, because my organization, the Swedish Assembly of Finland, we also work with integration issues and, and try to get uh, newcomers also to be integrated in, in the Swedish language in Finland. So I hope you will include us also in, in your future work. Uh, but uh, one question, um, what do you hope that the participants today will bring hope home from, from our seminar? Um, well, I will hope that they will take this Nordic uh, perspective uh, at heart and, and uh, look at these examples and experiences we have from the different Nordic, exam uh, Nordic uh, countries, because there really is something to learn from that, um, but also the pandemic has shown us and highlighted uh, different or perhaps the state of some integration efforts and that will bring to the surface uh, what we really have to work on. We see the, the, the gap in employment levels, for example, but also we've seen uh, the digital participation and competence. There's a digital divide there also between um, newly arrived and, and um, native born. So perhaps we can learn something from this pandemic and the experiences we have had from that. And Anna will get back to you with that cooperation suggestion. Thank so. you. Thank you, Kaisa. <laughs> uh, and the pandemic, we will also talk more about that now because uh, our next two speakers, Nora Sanchez Gassen and Vilda Hernes, uh, will provide us with info on how the pandemic has had an impact on integration processes in the Nordics. 
Uh, Dr. Nora sanchez gassen she's a senior uh, research fellow at Nordregio, and the focus on her work lies on demography, in particular on topics such as the causes and consequences of population change and population aging, migration and integration. Uh, she will today focus on a new report, Integrating Immigrants into the Nordic Labour Markets, the Impact of COVID-19 Pandemic. Uh, this this report was written on behalf of the Nordic Welfare Center uh, and provides a comprehensive overview of the current labor market situation of immigrant men and women during the pandemic and highlights interesting differences between the Nordic countries. Bilde Hernes, on the other hand, has a PhD in political science and works as a senior researcher as, at Oslo Metropolitan University. Her main research field is European or, and particularly Nordic integration policies, both concerning policy development, organization and effects. Uh, today, she will present results from a study uh, on the integration process during COVID-19 in Norway, the government response, the implementation, and some pre preliminary results. So happy to have you both here today, Nora and Wilde. Uh, and Nora, if you would like to start. Yes, thank you very much, Anna. I'm going to share my screen, and I hope this will work straight away. So I hope that you can now see uh, the full screen note of my presentation. Um, and please let me know if something works later on in the presentation. Um, so we, are seeing, said, hmm? we are seeing your, your view. So if you can change the display settings. Actually, I'm seeing it, it properly, but in, in a display mode. Um, I can stop sharing and try again. I'll see if it works for everyone then. Mm. Does it work now? As a full screen mode, yes? Yes. I'll move on and let me know if there's some challenge ahead. So um, as Anna said, my name is Nora sanchez Gassen. I work as a senior research fellow at Nordregio in Stockholm, where we do research for the entire Nordic region. And uh, recently we've published a report on behalf of the Nordic Welfare Center and actually as part of the integration program that Kaisa just talked about. And the title of our report is what you see here, integrating immigrants into the Nordic labor market, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we really looked at how the pandemic has affected labor market integration in the Nordic countries in a comparative um, perspective. Now we can say that um, as Kaiser mentioned, and we all know unemployment has increased during the pandemic and it has increased more strongly among immigrants than among the native born populations. So one can say that inequalities in the labor market are bigger now at the moment than they have been before the pandemic. The most recent uh, labor market data also show us that unemployment among immigrants has been going down uh, over the early summer. So this is a very positive sign, a very positive development. But of course, we also have to see what happens now over the winter with the pandemic and how that will affect um, the labor market situation, at least of immigrants. So it's a little bit of an un unsure situation we're in now, but at least recently there were some positive signs. Nonetheless, we can also say that unemployment among immigrants at the moment is still high, and this is what I'm going to showing you. I'm showing you here on this slide. Um, I've looked at the most recent unemployment data that were available. These are from the second quarter of this year. This means we look at the months April, May, and June of this year now, and you can see bars in two different colors on the screen. In blue, you can see the unemployment rate of foreign-born people, immigrants and an orange as a comparison, the unemployment rate of the native born people. So these are people born in Denmark, born in Finland, born in Iceland, etc. And if you compare here on this screen, the unemployment rates of these two groups, you can quite clearly see the gap that we still have uh, in our labor markets between the immigrants and the natives. And especially strongly in Sweden, if you look all the way there to the right, you can see that in the early summer this year, immigrants still had an unemployment rate of 20% in Sweden, while among natives, it was more around 6 or 7%. So there's still a lot of challenges. Even as I said, the most recent trend goes in a good direction, 
but there are still a lot of challenges uh, to be dealt with. And one can also say that these gaps that you see here in the unemployment rates uh, between immigrants and between natives, they are still stronger, they're still bigger than what we had before the pandemic. So the labor market is still more unequal than what we had before COVID came. Now, in our report, we also try to dig a bit deeper here because, of course, immigrants in the Nordic countries, that's a highly diverse group. They differ strongly in terms of region of origin, uh, the sector they work in, uh, age groups, um, and so forth. Uh, so we try to dig a bit deeper and see how different groups have been doing on the labor market. And I can't go into all of those details here. Um, but one uh, factor that I wanted to highlight uh, for you that I think is particularly uh, important, and here I'm building on what Kaisa said, um, that's the role of education. Because we knew already before the pandemic that education matters in the Nordic labor market. With higher education, there come better employment opportunities, and there come also higher employment rates. That was true before the pandemic, but I can tell you, I compared the data, it, uh, it applies even more now during the pandemic. So the role of education has become even stronger. And we can look at this in a little table that I created for you. Um, we can start by looking at Sweden. In the slide before, you saw that unemployment among immigrants was especially high in Sweden now, early in the summer. And as Kaisa already mentioned, those who are born outside of the EU uh, face the biggest challenges on the labor market. So we can start by looking at this group of immigrants, those born outside the EU. And then I've distinguished here for you three groups of education. We can look at immigrants with low educational attainment levels. These are immigrants who have either, either no formal education at all, or primary education or lower secondary education. Then we have a medium education group. Here we have immigrants that have completed their secondary education, perhaps with a bit of additional training. And then we have those with high education. These are immigrants who mostly have studied at university. And in the table, these numbers that you see here, these are the employment rates of the different groups. So now we are shifting the focus away from unemployment that we had before. Now we're looking at employment rates. And you can see that those with low education, 40% of those immigrants worked. Uh, among those with medium education, it was 70%. And among those with high education, it was already 75%. And these are the values for the year 2020. So our uh, the main pandemic here. And you can clearly see, I think, from this data, how employment chances, how employment rates go up with education. So I mean, education really matters. It improves chances on the labor market for immigrants. And it's not only the case actually for immigrants, we have the same picture if we look at our native population, so the people who are already born in Sweden. And this you can see here. I plotted again the employment rates of these groups, and you see the same pattern, low employment rates for those with low education, and then it goes up, up to over 90% of those with high education. So the main challenges are actually the same for all population groups. This is not specific to immigrants. And in the other Nordic countries, we find the same pattern. So I plotted the employment rates of the different groups for you here. And I know that's too much for you to digest now in, in a short period of time. But I can tell you that if we look at those trends across the countries, we more or less see the same picture uh, everywhere. With higher uh, education, we see an increase in employment rates. So education matters and it matters, as I said, even more now during the pandemic than before. And I think one reason for this is that so many jobs in tourism, hotels and restaurants have disappeared during the pandemic. And of course, these were jobs, these were sectors where those with low education uh, tended to work. That's why we have an even bigger gap between those educational groups now. Then you may wonder why is it then that those with low education have such a hard time on the Nordic labor markets? Why do they have these low employment rates? And one simple answer for this is, what well, is part of the answer is, is this. Uh, we have quite simply very few jobs available on the Nordic labor market for those with only basic skills or basic educational attainment levels. So on this figure, I've plotted for you a range of European countries. And what you can see is the share of people or the share of employees who work in so-called elementary occupations. These are jobs that do not require higher educational attainment. These are jobs that um, you can do even with, with lower educational uh, degrees uh, without specialized training. And you see in different colors, I've plotted the Nordic countries for you. And there on the left side, among those five countries with the lowest share of people, you see four Nordic countries, Norway, Sweden, Iceland, and Finland. So one can say that even in a European comparison, I think it quite clearly shows that there are remarkably few jobs available on the Nordic labor market for those who do not have higher education or at least medium educational attainment levels. There's quite 
simply very few jobs available. Uh, Denmark is a bit of a different story. Uh, you see Denmark is a little bit more to the, to the right there on the figure. Here we have some more jobs available for those uh, with lower education. So here it should also be a bit easier for immigrants uh, to find a job. But the other Nordic countries, uh, we, we, have, we have a different story. And here in a way you see in a nutshell the challenge of the Nordic countries. All the Nordic countries have quite sizable groups of immigrants at the moment. Many of those immigrants are highly educated, but between 30 and 40% of the immigrants belong to this group that have only low education. And at the same time, there's very few jobs available for this group. And that is, in a nutshell, the challenge that, that we are facing now and that has become even more pronounced during the pandemic. So how do we move forward after the pandemic? In our report, we actually worked together with seven different uh, researchers from Norway and Sweden. Uh, all with different perspectives, all with different approaches, uh, but together we've tried to come up with some policy recommendations and some suggestions uh, with how we could move forward. Um, and our suggestion, therefore, is that we have to focus on those immigrants with low educational attainment levels in the Nordic countries going forward. Immigrants with high education, they tend to integrate uh, much easier into the labor markets. We need to worry less about them, but those with, with low education, these need um, more support. In that sense, it's also really good to hear that from Kaiser that there's going to be some focus on education and language learning in the next year. I think that fits very well and is really needed. Of course, you could approach this, this topic and this, this case from two sides. On the one hand, we have to help immigrants increase their human capital, uh, as we see that really improves labor market opportunities. On the other hand, especially for those immigrants that have a long way uh, or are a long away from the, from the labor market and its requirements, one question that we also ask and discuss is the much more complicated, the much more controversial question of whether we do not need more elementary jobs, more simple jobs on the, the Nordic labor markets. As I tried to show you before, even in a European comparison, the Nordic countries, except Denmark, uh, really do stick out as having very few jobs uh, that people with low education can do. So the question is, do we need to address this in a way? Do we need to create more job opportunities uh, for people with lower educational degrees? That would not only benefit immigrants, by the way, but also the natives uh, who have dropped out of school, for example. So this very briefly, some of the points we address in our report, uh, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Nora, for an interesting presentation. Uh, you, you mentioned in, in the, in the um, in the end, that the Nordic countries should focus uh, the labor market integration efforts on immigrants with low education. Uh, and, uh, and you mentioned one suggestion was that uh, to help them increase their skills and human capital to fit better to, to labor market uh, demands. Uh, but what strategies exist uh, when it comes to increasing human capital? Mm -hmm. um, we have already published some reports on exactly that question uh, before the pandemic, so there's a lot to learn uh, from. There's a lot of knowledge already available in the Nordic region on what has worked. We know, for example, that language is crucial for labor market integration. There's research showing that immigrants who don't speak the language of their native country, they have really stronger obstacles. Uh, we know that um, different training programs on the job um, subsidize private sector employment, for example, if, if immigrants are um, put in a position where they can get into the labor market, learn on the job, get in contact with employers, that also works uh, quite well. And then, of course, all different forms of adult education, um, adult teaching, um, lifelong learning programs are, are very important. And always, um, I think the best solutions are always um, gotten if, if those programs are really in line with what is needed right now in different local labor markets. So if, if that can be tied together, the, the, the needs of the labor market um, together, yeah, combined with, with, with the educational programs, uh, that, that has tended to work best. Thanks again, Nora, so much. Um, now I would like to give the floor to Wilde. Uh, and please, what are your findings from Norway? Hi, just checking. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yes, I'll <clears throat> share the screen. Um, can you see my screen as well? Not yet. Not yet. Then I'll wait. Let me know. It says that I'm sharing my screen, but... Oh, at least I can see any... Now! Yes, now it's okay. Now Thanks. it's okay. Yep. Um, okay, so... Um, what happens to the integration process when society locks down? 
What happens to the social integration when we are encouraged by the government to only interact with a selected 10 people during one week? What happens to the integration process when unemployment levels reach a historical high and many businesses are restricted to operate as normal? And what happens to the regular elements in the integration process from language courses, employment practice, education measures, when society locks down and has strong restrictions on physical interactions. As Nora said here uh, very well, although there are some differences between countries, during financial crisis in general and during the COVID crisis, immigrants are disproportionately affected. But what about newcomers? We could also expect that this group will be hit hard by the crisis as studies show that persons who do not get employed the initial years after settlement more often experience long-term employment. So what was the government response to these challenges in Norway? The Norwegian government issued a temporary legislation with adaptions to the Introduction Act with three groups of measures. First, it made adjustments in the rights and obligations allowing for partial participation in the introduction program, easement of absence rules, and allowing for, for example, digital training. It also opened up for prolonging the introduction program and Norwegian training to uh, four to six months uh, relative to previous rights. And they opened up for offering professional career guidance for those in need. The government adopted funding packages for municipalities and counties in order to cover the costs of new and expanded measures called the integration packages. Uh, there have been three integration packages in the pandemic uh, so far, and they amount in total to around 1 billion Norwegian kroners. So what have we done here? Niver uh, at Oslomet has, on assignment from the Ministry of Education and Research, evaluated the implementation of these integration packages and studied how public actors have worked with the integration process during the pandemic. We have already published two evaluations, one in January and June, and I just finished the last interview for the third evaluation yesterday. Uh, but we have conducted surveys to municipalities and counties. We have uh, uh, conducted case studies and done analysis of registered data. So what have we found? Naturally, local actors, the municipalities and counties, they were extremely happy to receive extra funds in these difficult times. But in the initial phase, there were many implementation challenges. One challenge was that the rapid changes and the new measures were not possible to implement through the existing data systems. So the reporting, documenting, documenting decisions or prolongment. Uh, and this led to a lot of extra work and confusion for lower governmental levels. Additionally, there was not sufficient information and guidance from the national actors. There were interpretation challenges with the new legislation. And during our evaluation, we even talked to actors that did not even know about these measures and the new funding. And due to this information gap, we find that immigrants' rights were ex uh, to get extended introduction programs and Norwegian training has been implemented in varying degree across the country. When it comes to the usage of different measures in the introduction program, the lockdown and restrictions on physical interaction naturally led to a decrease in labor-oriented measures, such as on-the-job training and subsidized employment, measures with no work in the integration process. The usage of, usage of language training and education measures were stable and increased. Um, and although the training had partly turned digital, of course, during periods with high infection rates, but still, in the case studies, we found that many worried that the quality was not the same and that persons with low literacy and digital skills had severe challenges when the language courses and education turned digital. We did find some good news in all these challenges. An analysis of the introduction program participants that actually finished their program during the pandemic 
show that there was only a minimal increase in persons that transitioned into social benefits after the program. We do, however, see a clear decline in persons that transitioned into employment. However, more people started or continued in lower and higher education. So based on these evaluations, we may summarize some short-term lessons. First of all, information is key. Society experienced tremendous changes overnight, and the municipalities were bombarded with new regulations and financial relief packages to mitigate ne negative consequences of the pandemic. Although there will always be challenges when implementing new policies overnight, information and guidance to the relevant actors is crucial. And these evaluations also highlight the importance of ensuring basic qualification and lifelong learning, as Noura also mentioned, and digital and computer literacy from day one. These are basic skills that we need in today's society. Lastly, when thinking about the way forward, we do not know the long-term consequences of the pandemic for newly arrived immigrants. But one major concern is how the pandemic have hindered arenas for social integration into local societies. Also, that many newly arrived refugees have, have had almost their entire language training and introduction program during the pandemic with digital, digital teaching and few options for on-the-job training opens the question for what the long-term effects for this group will be. And I also want to highlight one potential severe consequence for the individual. In many Nordic countries, there are now language or income and self-sufficiency requirements for obtaining permanent residency and eventually citizenship. Thus, the consequences of weak language training, furlongs and unemployment caused by the pandemic may have severe consequences for the individual's possibility to be ensured a secure legal status. So as the pandemic keeps on giving, yesterday, new restrictions on social interaction were introduced in Norway once again. It is pivotal that we follow this group closely to mitigate not only the negative impacts the pandemic may have on this group from a societal perspective and a labor market perspective, but also potential severe negative side effects for the individual's safety and well-being. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wilde, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I have a hard question for you. Uh, fr from your perspective, uh, before we even think about uh, migrants getting a job, uh, what needs to be in place? Uh, you mentioned, of course, um, information, but, but what else is crucial? Well, one thing we found in this evaluation is that you just you just need the basic equipment. Uh, not in some municipalities, they already have computers or phones so they can participate in these digital for, uh, forums. But in many uh, municipalities, that was something they had to find from the uh, when the pandemic hit. So you can think about just basic uh, basic. Um, uh, equipment to be part of this digital world that we will will increase even though the pandemic hopefully will end eventually. Uh, but I want to echo what Nora, um, uh, Nora said in the beginning that there are so many studies that show the importance of education uh, and language training uh, to be part of the Nordic uh, labor markets. So well, a positive thing we found in this evaluation was that even though there are fewer people who go into employment and have employment measures, we see more people in basic education at different levels. So I would also say that I think that is a way forward, especially this is an opportunity to uh, increase the basic skills that are needed in the Nordic labor markets when there are fewer jobs for this group. Thank you so much, Nora and Wilde, uh, and I hope that we will have time in the end to discuss even more with you too. Uh, now we are moving on to the role of the civil society and non-governmental organizations in integration efforts, and I would like to welcome Dora Puhakka as our next speaker. Dora is a member of Moniheli, 
uh, Monihelis member organizations, uh, Finnish Namibian Society, Nice Hearts and Familia. And if you wonder what Moniheli then is, uh, I can tell you that Moniheli is a Finnish multicultural network of over a hundred organizations that support immigrants, uh, integration and social inclusion and promotes equality. So Dora, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. I hope you can see me and you can hear me. I can hear you, but actually I can't see you. Sorry. Yes, now I, I can see you. I hope you can see, see me. Yes, yes. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. I And thank you for introducing me. I just shared in the chat something about Moniheli, our web page and uh, a link that will take, us, take, take you to the member organizations of Moniheli. Uh, I have prepared a small PowerPoint just to, okay, to, to share something that we are doing and to show you the role of um, the civil society and non-governmental organizations in integration. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes, but if you could put it in, uh, in a presenter mode, because now we see the whole. This is strange. Thank you. Let me just try again. Uh, this keeps happening. And now? Ah, it's the same. No, 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 it's working. Yes, That's better. Perfect. Okay, wonderful. Um, I decided that I will skip the definitions because we have very, very limited time and um, I'm speaking from a totally different maybe perspective because um, I've been volunteering and working at different organizations, uh, including member organizations of Moniheli. Uh, and I will start with just a minute, sharing what is happening in Finland. Uh, I'll talk about the opportunities and services rendered by member organizations of Moniheli. Moniheli's member organizations are predominantly started by immigrants in Finland. And this is what happens when immigrants are playing um, an active role in the process of immigration. The first thing that is happening is that uh, these organizations are organizing peer support activities where information is shared, skills are passed on to each other and people are forming networks. An example of this is Familia RU which is operating in Finland. We also have um, social and cultural events where people's sense of belonging in the society is, in, is increased. An example of this is uh, by the Finnish Namibian Society. Uh, Familia is also organizing Finnish language classes. Um, hearing, I think Kaisa and Nora were speaking about the language and this is what's happening, being organized by um, Familia. Then Familia is also organizing employment uh, events where people are enhancing their employment skills and um, they are getting support to increase their chances of getting employed in Finland. This includes networking, working on their CVs and preparing for interviews. Um, then we'll go to Nice Hearts where there's a lot of volunteer activities, especially for women of immigrant origin, where women are encouraged to participate and take an active role in the society by organizing different things. And uh, through these actions, learning how things work in Finland, how to organize events, how to go about different things and um, enhance their language skills as they do that. They get experience they build their networks locally. Then Nice Hearts also is about advocacy and understanding uh, women's and immigrant social rights and representation of immigrants in different levels of decision-making processes in the society. Um, I will add to that uh, the Finnish Refugee Council where I was working previously, where uh, the Finnish Refugee Council takes the role of training peer support group facilitators who are responsible for sharing information and um, 
the skills amongst the immigrants in Finland, as well as consulting and training organizations, the Finnish organizations that may not be as, um, as much involved in diversity and inclusion to have that implemented in their strategies. And everyone at Moniheli is about creating a safe space where everyone that participates feels like uh, the events that are organized are also for them. I'm about to run out of, the, of my time, so I'll try to be really quick. Um, Anna just introduced Moniheli. I will just say a few things about Moniheli. It's a network of over 100 multicultural organizations. It's a bilingual um, organization. It operates in Finnish and in English, just to be more inclusive and diverse. Um, it organizes multilingual activities in many, many different languages um, that represent the immigrants in Finland. It is about advocacy. It has uh, representation in advisory councils in the, within the ministries of Finland. It uh, distributes funding to the member organizations, and this is done in collaboration with the public sector. It, um, Moniheli is also really active in terms of partnerships between the city cities, the ministries, and different organizations, be it multicultural or Finnish organizations. It's really, really active. And it also pilots different projects. I'll just give you an example of projects that are ongoing, uh, starting with what we're focusing on currently is the first one, uh, the housing information project, which is fat because it's now, basically it has permanent funding from the public sector. Uh, the point is to ensure that immigrants that are living in Finland uh, have access to information related to how to find a house and things, that, uh, different information that's related to finding a house and living in a house in Finland in a language that uh, they understand, including Finnish, uh, simple Finnish, English, Arabic, different languages. Uh, then the three others are still in the pilot mode. And these include uh, a project to enhance health equality, everybody's access to health services, getting information about uh, different diseases that, are, that exists that exist and um, also getting information related to topics that may not be as sensitively tackled, uh, taking into consideration people's cultures. Recently, we just, um, we have just had COVID, uh, the pandemic, or we are going through that. Uh, being able to disseminate information to the public in, in, a, multi in, in a multilinguistic manner was possible in Finland because there was there is access to people who speak different languages. Uh, then the next one we have is on a project to ensure educational equality. The target group here is parents of immigrant background, uh, how they can support their children to find the right path um, in their education, uh, study counselors at schools to how, how they can support the children to choose the right path in, in their studies and also to enhance collaboration between schools and homes. Then um, the last one, um, I think it's also related to something that I think Wilde was speaking about digital literacy. A lot of people may be educated, but their education may not be understood because systems are very different languages are very different and structures are also very different. So supporting uh, multicultural organizations, digital uh, literacy is also an important element that is happening currently in Moniheli. And there's a project being piloted to do that. These four are the ones that are currently happening. There's a lot of things that have happened before or that are hopefully going to happen. I cannot spill the beans because we're going to hear tomorrow what would what money will be out and what money is not out. But we're just very very hopeful, and um, I'll go to the next point where I'll talk about the challenges that Moniheli has or the civil society has. 
Uh, when I speak about the civil society, I mean the third or sometimes even the fourth sector that usually is occupied by immigrants. Um, equal access to information that is not available in languages that people in the public speak. Funding sources are very, very difficult to access um, when it comes to the third and the fourth sector. Lack of paid and permanent staff. A lot of times um, activities are run by volunteers and these volunteers may not be as privileged to have access to information or networks that, are, that would make things better for them to function. And then computer literacy that I just spoke about uh, is also a problem because people's level of literacy in computers is not really uh, at par and digitalization is a reality now, especially with COVID. And then the unforeseen crisis that may occur as an example of COVID. Um, I'll try to be really quick, but this is uh, my last part that the civil society's role is to close the gap between the privileged and the intersectionally underprivileged beings in the society through active participation, uh, representation, and the empowerment that actually happens at the end of the, at, at the end of this whole process of those that need it the most for an equal access to information and resources. Thank you and sorry for taking up too much time. Thank you, Dora, for a very interesting presentation. And, and thank you also for your very valuable work. Uh, the civil society is, is key in, in so many senses. Uh, we're a bit behind in, in the time schedule. Uh, so I will go on by introducing our next speaker, which is Antti Kaihovara, who is a senior specialist from the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Employment in Finland. Uh, more specifically, he works in the Center of Expertise in Immigrant Integration and, and works with issues concerning employment, statistics and research collaboration. Antti, you will speak about changes and challenges regarding Finland's integration program, and we are so happy to have you with us. Varsavud, ole hyvä. Now we are muted. Okay, so thanks a um, Just a second, I will share my screen. So I hope you can now see my presentation and hear my voice as well. Yes. So great. So yeah, as mentioned, my name is Antti Kaihovar and I work in the Ministry of, of Economic Affairs and Employment. I will uh, talk briefly about the labor market integration of refugees in Finland. So let's start by looking at the employment rates of refugees and, and other immigrants in, in several countries. And on the graph on the left hand side, you can see the employment rates right after migration and then years after migration. And uh, when you look at Finland, you can see that 10 years after migration, the uh, average employment rate of refugees is somewhere around 25%, which is pretty low in comparison to other countries. Uh, in fact, it's about 35 to 40% percentage points lower than in, in, in the most relevant reference countries, Sweden and, and Norway. And it's also quite a bit lower than in Denmark. So, so based on this graph, which is by the way, uh, based on the study by Brel, Preston and, and Dustman published last year, uh, we're not doing that great in terms of labor market integration of refugees. This being said, there are some flaws in this graph. For example, it's based on different data sources. So the definitions of refugees and, and uh, even the definitions of employment might be a bit different in different data sources. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I'd say that even if the, uh, you know, the differences in employment rate were about half of what they are showing this graph, uh, I'd say that we are um, in a situation where we really have to look for, for something to, to improve the situation. So why is this the case? Why we're not doing that well? Uh, I'd, I'd love to give you the answer, but to be, to be honest, we don't know at this point. So there are lots of potential explanations why this might be the case. So, you know, the integration systems in different countries might be different. Uh, this is partly true, but, but anyway, I would say that uh, there are more 
similarities than there are differences between at least between the system in Finland, Sweden and, and Norway. Um, it could be about labor market discrimination. It, it is a huge problem, but uh, and, and also discrimination in other areas of life. But uh, I don't think that, uh, or at least I don't believe that the differences between the Nordic countries are that huge in, in that sector. So, so that's, uh, I don't believe that's kind of convincing uh, explanation here. It could be about incentives. Uh, for example, we still have the home care allowance in, in Finland. Uh, which kind of uh, doesn't incentivize people or parents with, with young children to participate in the labor market. And this is something that could actually uh, have at least a um, moderate uh, impact, I would say. It could be about the characteristics of the ref refugee population in different countries. Yeah, maybe so. I mean, you know, they, they might differ in terms of education and in terms of health, in terms of traumas and so forth. But at least based on the data I've seen, uh, uh, based on education, there aren't that big differences between the, the Nordic countries. Also, when we talk about the labor market characteristics, obviously the employment rate in other countries, in, in other Nordic countries is, is a bit higher than it is in Finland. But overall, we're talking about countries that are kind of highly developed and, and where you know, entering the labor market requires quite a bit of education and quite a bit of um, um, at, at least some language skills. So, so based on that, I wouldn't say that uh, you know, the labor market characteristics can explain, explain all this. And, and finally, it could be about the fact that um, that uh, large scale migration to Finland, if you can use that term, is, is is kind of relatively new in comparison to other countries. So this might mean that there are less kind of good role models and less less kind of uh, um, ethnic networks and other networks. So so that might also uh, kind of hinder the the labor market integration of refugees. So these are some potential explanations. So. What about the answers? What, what can we do to, to tackle this problem? Um, obviously, we you would think that we should look at what other countries are doing who are doing better than us and just copy their model. Or we could look at what kind of the academic literature on this subject says and, and just kind of try to implement that. But the problem here is that the evidence is uh, quite ambiguous. So from different studies, we know but we have actually pretty quality papers that study uh, active labor market policies and uh, which study integration policies. But you know, when, when you look at the big picture, it's still quite, quite blurry, I would say. Um, we know that subsidized employment, for example, is, is one of the probably the most effective form of active labor market policy. We also know that uh, you, you should invest in formal education, especially in vocational education to, to uh, improve the chances in the labor market. Language training is obviously important that there's many studies that have, have uh, shown this. Uh, but the problem here is that, you know, I would say that we already have quite comprehensive language training as a part of the integration program. So I'm not sure whether kind of uh, adding lessons and adding hours to that, that might, would, would improve the situation much. Maybe we should focus more about the quality of the training that that could do something. Then we have some papers that show that counseling and, and the reduction of caseload of caseworkers might work. That's that's probably true. But once again, here is the resource problem. So right now we don't have that much resources to allocate to these to this, um, uh, these measures. And and finally, uh, some papers have shown that fast shown that faster handling of residence permits of, of asylum seekers uh, could could increase or speed up their uh, entry to the labor market. That this is probably true, and uh, I think that this this applies to to also other other possible waiting times during the integration process. So so that that's something that we should uh, focus a bit more to to to, to try to um, reduce the the waiting time. Um, what about the other countries, other other Nordic countries? What can we learn from them? Um, Probably a lot, but but the problem is that it's hard to say which uh, to which country we should turn into and we, whose system should we copy. So, for example, in Denmark, they there's uh, they put a lot of emphasis on uh, entering the labor market fast. They have these work first policies, um, and and they at, at least to some studies they do work at least in the short term. 
But on the other hand, when you look at the long term, it seems like that uh, that Norway has actually the highest employment rate of refugees. And Norway perhaps focuses a bit more on accumulation of human capital and, and former education. And, and one more thing that I like about the Norwegian model, at least on legisl legislative level, is that they do have kind of these different pathways for different target groups. So they have clear pathways uh, based on the, the education and, and uh, uh, age of of the the participants, so that that might be something we should uh, uh, copy or learn from. Sweden, on the other hand, is um, it, it's a part country to put in place like it, they they have some similarities with Denmark and some with Norway so so there is a tendency to fo to focus on on language training and, and and education but at the same time there is this snap score fast track for for those who already have some kind of skills that could be uh, could have demand on on the Swedish labor market they they put more money on subsidized employment they they are at least introducing I'm not sure whether it's uh, already uh, working the uh, at job uh, so so, so there might be something, but it's hard to disentangle like what part of the Swedish model we should try to copy. Anyway, um, even though we still have knowledge gaps, we need to do something. And we are currently reforming the act on the promotion of, of uh, immigrant integration. And this is still work in progress. So these are more, more of uh, pro proposals and goals of this process. Uh, uh, but anyway, I will introduce them shortly. This is my last slide, by the way. Um, first of all, the overall responsibility for organizing integration services will be transferred to municipality, whereas now it has been on the state level. And, and this is actually something that is not that much based on academic evidence. This is more of a politi political decision. It might work. I'm not saying that it wouldn't, but uh, we, we just don't know at this point. But anyway, at, at, as a part of this process, we're also introducing this municipality integration program, which pretty includes pretty many um, quite similar elements than, than the program we are having right now, but the aim is to, to strengthen the, the target orientation and, and individuality and to, to form a clearer system, both for, for the participants and for the case workers and, and experts uh, working with, with integration. And obviously the main goal is to speed up the transition to, to working life and, and or education, depending on on the kind of the pathway that is taken. One of the big changes is, is that, um, you know, the duration of integration plan will still be individual, but right now it has been, as a rule of thumb, it has been, it should not exceed three years, but now uh, it will be shortened. So, so in, in the new, new proposal, it, it would not exceed two years. So that might, speed up the, the integration process, but it might also create a lot of problems because it's it's hard to do the same things in, in two years time than, than was done in, in three years time before. Uh, two more things that we're doing, we're also improving the av availability of low threshold guidance and counseling. And, and this is not just for uh, participants or refugees, this is for all, all immigrants. And, and I think this, this is quite important in a sense that this helps to guide people to the, uh, the to the pathways that are most suitable for them that are uh what they are uh, what what they what they um kind of prefer and what are most suitable for them so that might take some of the waiting time before and and you know uh help help the to guide people to the right right tracks and per perhaps the most important thing would be to to try to increase the participation rate. So try to reach out uh, to those who are outside the labor force, who are, for example, taking uh, care of their children at home, because there's lots of evidence that participation rate to the labor force goes hand in hand with employment rate. So this means that basically in any given population, if you can improve the participation rate, you can also improve the employment rate at the same time. I'll end here and say thank you. No, thank you, Antti, for a very interesting presentation. And uh, at least for me, it, it raised many, many questions and, uh, and, and uh, possible comments also. And it will be, for instance, interesting to see uh, the shortening of the integration plan to two years, what effects that will have uh, 
and also something that perhaps uh, uh, someone should do a bit of research uh, afterwards also. Uh, unfortunately, we were planning to have a session, a joint session with all our speakers here in the end, but, but uh, the time is running out. So uh, unfortunately, you will have to, to send your possible questions to, directly through the chat to the speakers because uh, we don't have time to, to take them up here. Uh, but I want to take this opportunity to, to say thank you to all of our excellent speakers and of course, also to you, uh, the, the audience, and uh, also to to give the microphone back to you, Jens. Or before I give the floor to, to, back to you, Jens, I want to remind you of uh, going to the website or visiting the website integrationnorden.org, where you find uh, a, a site that is packed with facts and uh, useful links. Um, so if you're interested in the subject, and obviously you are because you are uh, joining this seminar, uh, go to the website and find more info there.